Yeah, this is nice. Th thank you. I, really two big thanks out of the gate. Foremost, to let us get back be, because you let us through your doors. Um, I've got to preach at all three of the churches now after today. Well, because I've preached one service, I can say this, that since, since we started this project, I preached at our first church in Gridley. Uh, they had us back, and obviously in, in Burlington, um, up, up to leaving, and now getting to be here with you. It's been fun to kind of circle the wagons and, and see the ministries that we've been a part of and what they've been doing. Some of you guys, uh, because this is a f familiar face situation, a lot of you are still familiar to our family. I'll give you a little uh, background. I've had some questions. Why why are you planning a church? Uh, why Eudora? You know, how did things go in Burlington? What's going on? And so um, just to backfill where we were when we left here, we did go to Burlington, Kansas. Uh, Burlington at the time, the Christian church there was 149 years old. Uh, then it's 155 years old today. It's a church that's a year older than the state of Kansas. And so it was kind of neat. We went from a church plant here uh, to a very established church that's been around a long time. And it very much was an, a revitalization ministry. Uh, the church had been stagnant for a long season. They would built a new facility in hopes that that would spark uh, growth. But they were running about 100 people carrying $660,000 in debt. And so it was a desperate situation. And so I was young and dumb and said, this is a church that obviously has faith, right? If you're going to carry a debt load like that, you have faith. And so God blessed it. The church there is out of debt today. And they're averaging 220 people on, on a Sunday in worship through this year. And God, God gets the glory for, for all of that. And um, I'll, I'll be real, it's because of faithful people that, that came into opportunities. There's some oil in that area, and I, I'm, I don't have any bones to say it was because of faithful people that owned some oil businesses that said, hey, when, when we came into it, we want to give to the kingdom that retired some of that. So it wasn't because of a great work Jeremiah did. It was a great work that the body did in coming together and being the church. And so is what triggered the church plant deal is, is obviously we were chopping wood trying to get that church into a, to a healthier place than when we got there. And um, for three, the last three years, I came on board of the CEA of Kansas and started attending their meetings and, uh, and jumping in with that. And for the last three years prior to us submitting a resume for this, we had money on the table to plant a church. We were only needing a planter. For three years. And so three years ago, the prayer was really easy. God, we need a church planter to go to Hayes, Kansas, because uh, for three years of that time, we were just looking specifically at Hayes, Kansas. Well, it was this time last year that the site committee of the CEA said there are really six communities in Kansas that could, that could have a church go today. And really, that's what opened my eyes. I knew from being here at Crossroads, we're in the church planting business. We don't need a church. We need churches. But it became a little more real to me as all of a sudden, we've been praying for a church. And in my immaturity, I've been asking God for a church when we really need churches. I think this community has been blessed over the last 21 years to have this church. And there are communities all over this state and all over this nation and world that need more churches. And so the second part of my thanks to you today is thank you that though you've been planted by the CEA and though you are no longer on support from the CEA, you continue to faithfully give to the CEA because Crossroads has maintained this vision for more churches. Well, that's really what stirred Megan and I. It was about this time last year that we started the conversation uh, where, you know, what, what's going on here in Burlington? You know, where are we going to be long term? If, if there's a time to, to make a move, the church is healthy, they're out of debt, they may need to build again in the future. And so if we started the building project, you know, then we'd be tied there because I wasn't going to leave them in debt again. And so we were just at that plant place where we prayed and we said, God, we hope out of this there could be two healthy churches. And Burlington, the Christian Church of Burlington, is supporting us. Uh, and so we really feel like we're being sent as, as part of this project as well. And um, we've been encouraged. We gave Burlington 100 days notice, which is a longer than typical for a ministry a minister leaving his ministry, partially because we wanted them to be able to have the time to hire a good minister. And two weeks after we left, the new minister started, and uh, they got a young minister with a nice family there that's, doing, that's carrying on the good work there, not to mention a wonderful associate minister in Carl Nurnberger, who's really been a great nucleus 
and uh, obviously many of you know him because he had come from Crossroads as well. So there's some, some back uh, feel of what got us to this place and why we're church planting. And really the reason that we chose Eudora when we looked at the six different sites is we just felt like our, our gifts and uh, our family's abilities were best served uh, there. Uh, predominantly they say you attract people like you. And Eudora is a town, it's very much a bedroom community. 18% of Eudora is under the age of 12. There are tons of young professional families in that town. It boasts the largest elementary school in the state of Kansas. And so when we think about a global missional opportunity of raising up a generation of believers, because this is what we should know about bedroom communities, kids grow up and they don't stay in that community. They leave that community uh, to go where the jobs will take them. Some of them will come back. Um, but we see this as a great opportunity to, to reach some young families and to win some, uh, the next generation of believers that could go out and really be uh, conquering the world as long as Jesus tarries in his return. And so we're excited about the place. We're excited about our opportunity there in Eudora to win uh, that, that region. You know, coming into church planting and, and all of life, we, we come into situations, though, uh, and like I said, uh, last church I served is 155 years old, and, um, and so it's a year older than the state of Kansas, and so you, you go from, from having a fixed perspective on what church looks like. Sometimes we go into jobs or into situations, and we have a fixed perspective, and, and that's where today, uh, I, it might be that some of us need to shift our perspective, and the perspective we're going to discuss today is really the role of the church. What is the role of the church, or even in specific, our role as a Christ follower? What's our role in the church as a Christ follower? Uh, to give you an example of a fixed perspective, I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, in a subdivision on the south side, uh, outside of Fountain. Uh, the, the division I lived in was called Security, but we would go down to Fountain because Fountain had a Dairy Queen. And, and Dairy Queens are like the small town fast food restaurant. If, you, if you've noticed anybody from small towns, you love Dairy Queen. Well, Burlington had a Dairy Queen, and I think the reason we picked Eudora is because it has a... Okay, that's not the reason, but it does have a Dairy Queen. And I, I want to tell you, my favorite hamburger in the world is at Dairy Queen. They make the flamethrower, and I'm a spicy guy. I like, I like heat when I'm chewing on that sandwich, and so it's, it's really good stuff. Well, a month ago, we were doing some training in, uh, out in western Can or Texas, West Texas, in Midland, Texas, and I've never driven to West Texas in my life. I know everything's supposed to be bigger in Texas. I think it's just different. It's a, it's a different world. And, and see, I got excited because the team in the car, you know, we've, we've all got smartphones and doing things. And we're like, well, the next town up here has a Dairy Queen. <laughs> where are we going to stop for lunch, you know? And I'm like, woo, I know where I, I, my boat goes. And it's Dairy Queen. And I think it was the only fast food joint in this town. And so we, we come into this little town and there's a Dairy Queen. I don't even know what town it was. I was just too excited about Dairy Queen in West Texas. And I walk in, and I've got this perspective, but I know what I'm going to order. The flamethrower is going in my mouth in about 10 minutes. And I walk in the door, and I look over the menu, and the only thing I recognize is the ice cream. The menu is different. You know what I ordered at Dairy Queen in West Texas? Tacos. <laughs> I ordered tacos at Dairy Queen, and well, I'm telling you, we go into life situations with a perspective, don't we? And sometimes that perspective needs tweaked because things aren't always as they appear. And sometimes that's, that's what we do in church. I think that's one of the strengths of Crossroads. From day one, the DNA of the leadership that, that they've had is you've had a good DNA where you focus on the reality that some people, when they look at church, they have a perspective that when they look in the past, the church had hurt them. The church had not always been there for them. It had messed with their family. It had judged them when their, when their family went through a crisis like divorce or uh, when they were hung up with addiction or, or something went on in life. And so because of that, very purposefully, Crossroads Christian Church said, we want to change the perspective of what we do 
as a church. And for some of you, that's your testimony. It was so freeing to find a church family like this that would welcome you as you were and get you to Jesus so he could be the one that, that brings about the change in your life because of healthy perspective. I want to just be honest and real with you today. Part of planning a church has been healthy for us to get us to change our perspective. Because I want to tell you, the last uh, several years in Burlington, I found myself trying to get to know an established church where I was only hanging out with Christian people. And I, I had a perspective that probably wasn't as much like the shepherd's perspective, and that probably led to some of the discomfort that Megan and I had that we needed to do something different in following Jesus to be effective kingdom workers in this season of our life. And so today, uh, ultimately, what I, what I want to challenge us with today is we, we want to endeavor to answer this question as we look at Luke chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, go there if you would. But how can we produce a shepherd's perspective for the church? If we're going to be the church, if we want a pro, uh, an appropriate role, then I can think of nobody else to follow than Jesus himself, right? And so today, that's what we're going to focus on. What was Jesus' methodology? How did, how did he go about um, winning people? And really, when it comes to the role of the church, that, that is all of our missions. We want to make sure that we're continuing to, to win lost people and bring them to maturity. And in order to do this, in order to answer this question, how can we produce a shepherd's perspective for the church? Uh, we're going to look at a few practical ways. And the first way that we're going to come across here is we must change our perception of lost people. I think the longer that we're in Christ, the easier it is for us to fixate our idea of lost people as people that are less. Not only do we associate them with lost, but we associate them with less. I mean, after all, they haven't uh, said yes to Jesus. They're, they're not where we are. They're not on the same plane. And so they're a less than. They're not an equal to us. We are obviously superior to them because we're in Christ. And that is a very unhealthy perspective and perception of lost people. And really, it's what we found in the first century. Let's read the, the text. Let's look at the first four verses there in Luke 15. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him, referring to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. I find it fascinating. Jesus was being complained to, criticized, and so he tells them, a parable, what man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the 99 in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? A rhetorical question, one that had an obvious answer. None of us want to lose anything that's ours. And yet in my Christian subculture, I had insulated myself from lost people. All of my friends were people in the faith or that we'd want to put an ED on salvation and call saved. I began to spend all my free time in the church and in my ministry. I found myself spending hours inside of my office when I would have been better by far hanging out with people down in a coffee shop or uh, the people that just needed to know Jesus as their Savior in their Lord. You know, I had the perception of the Pharisees in the first century. That's where I was. And for some of us, that's, that's our testimony today. We got in Christ, and the longer we've been in Christ, the more we've insulated ourselves from the world. Where all of a sudden we even ask ourselves, do I, do I know lost people? Do I hang out with lost people? Where do I spend my free time? Because let's, let's be real, we've heard this sermon about bad company corrupts good character way more than we've heard the sermon. This week you need to go meet a sinner and dine with them. You need to go hang out with a, with a sinner. I mean, that, that, it even feels weird coming out of a preacher's mouth, right? I mean... We don't want to hear that sermon, and yet what was Jesus being criticized for? That's a perception change, isn't it? For some of us, this is a hard look, and this is what was good for me. These first two verses, I've known these parables for a long time. I was in a Bible scholar deal in high school. I memorized this whole chapter in the NIV 1984 edition. So I'm preaching out of the Holman Christian today, so that's why I'm looking at it. But what's our perception? I, I felt like I had arrived spiritually, and yet I was living among lost people that I wasn't 
reaching where it was. If we want to learn to have a perception of lost people, it's right there in verse 2. There's two things that we can be more like Jesus to do. This is how the shepherd acts towards lost people. If we want to do it, apply these two things. He welcomes them. And friends, I want to tell you, Crossroads Christian Church is a great welcoming church. You guys do a really good job of making sure people feel welcome. But this is my challenge, church. What happens in your individual life outside of Sunday morning? How welcoming are you to that lost person in your workplaces or when you're shopping in Target or when you're sipping coffee with the ladies? Because this has become my sub-Christian culture experience. We get around the water cooler with Johnny, and Johnny uh, talks about the last lady that he's been with in the, in the one-night stand, and all of a sudden we feel like something's in the water, and so we stop talking with Johnny at the water cooler. Because we're going to insulate ourselves from what's going on in his world. Or we like to go drink the coffee with the ladies, but all of a sudden they like to talk about business, and it's typically not their business. And we, we get caught up in it, and we don't want to get caught up in it anymore, so we decide, I'm just going to stop drinking coffee with the ladies. And instead of being a better influencer in those areas, we insulate ourselves from the opportunities that are right in front of our face to be a great uh, in, influencer. But Jesus welcomed them, and then he went a step further, he ate with them. That's why this was my question. You wondered, what in the world, Holcomb, why are you asking the question of, you know, who, who do you dine with, or who's the last person that you've had over to eat with you? This is my first formal challenge that I give to you this, this week, and really uh, the, the next few weeks, I'll give you some time to play this out. Jesus didn't only welcome the, the sinners and the tax collectors, he ate with them, and often, often at their place. If you can get in their place, it's even better. But this is what I want to challenge everybody in here to do. Between now and, and Christmas Eve, I want you to invite somebody over to your place that is not in Christ, intentionally to dine with them. Maybe you don't feel like you can do that in your home. Take them out to a restaurant. That works out too. And on purpose, do it in that setting. Invite them to your Christmas Eve service or invite them to worship. Invite them to your small groups. Small groups are a great front door of ministry where people that are not in Christ, they, they find great comfort in that setting. But some of us, we, we go, I don't know how to do it. Jesus just modeled it. Go eat with them. And then in that intimate place, you can make the ask because you have their attention. You're relaxed. You're in a place that's comfortable. And then they realize that you do value them for them. And that's all Jesus was saying in this parable is that, look, don't we value our lost sheep? And he, he lived in the first century that was not so different from 500 years prior. Remember the words to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34? Man, your shepherds, are, they're all wrong. They've been fattening themselves. They're not caring for the lost sheep. Who's, who's God talking about to Ezekiel in the Old Testament? He's talking about the spiritual leaders of the church. And here these people are, the, the, the sinners and the tax collectors. They're Jews that are not being ministered to by the spiritual leaders of their day. And so they're excited that Jesus will give them an audience. And so they're flocking to him. And what's Jesus really challenging? He's challenging the Pharisees saying, look, guys, you're not being very good spiritual leaders because you're not valuing these people. If you valued these people like you did your sheep, you'd be better by far. Instead of complaining about me doing it, you'd be pulling up a chair and doing it with me. And that was the perception uh, that Jesus had. We can look at this idea, lost people, we've got to go to them. The Great Commission, we've got one active verb in the whole text. I capitalized it, make disciples, mathetusate. And then we get participles that say how to do it. We've got to go to them. They don't happen by just having a worship service. If we expect that church planning is going to look like sending out a bunch of mailers and saying we're having our first Sunday and that's our only touch in Eudora, we're not going to succeed. <laughs> But so you know, part of the fun has been doing the outreach and going to people. We started, let me, let me tell you a fun story. Megan and I went door to door in the community our first week that we were in town. We took our boys with us because who doesn't uh, like two little boys knocking on doors saying, hi, we're your new neighbors in town, and we're throwing a party. It's called an ice cream party. This was August, so today ice cream wouldn't work. If we moved at this time of year, it'd be hot chocolate party. But back then, it was ice cream party in August, and... Um, we're, we're crazy enough to say, will you bring ice cream to our ice cream party? 
And we felt like losers, you know. We're like, we just went around, we handed out flyers to our neighborhood and, and just invited a whole bunch of people. And as we met people in that week saying, hey, this Sunday night we're having an ice cream party at our house. Come and, come and party with us over ice cream, right? And uh, we're sitting there just before it goes and we're going, man, we're pretty stupid. What did we, we asked people to bring ice cream to our ice cream party. 34 people showed up to our house. Because we got outside the box a little bit, and we went to our neighbors. And just under the decoy, people are hungry for a face-to-face opportunity to meet somebody new. You're talking about opportunities. They're out there. You just got to think outside the box. That's all we said is we knew that once people know we're the pastor, it's going to be harder to get them into our house (laughs) uh, for for ice cream. And so, but hopefully by them, we we can establish in, in our neighborhood here, and this can just, you know, we just practice the Jerusalem to Judea to the ends of the earth and we started with our neighborhood 34 I I still am overwhelmed by what God does because you step out in faith a little bit and say will we do it will you go to people what did in that the model of Acts 1 8 Jerusalem Judea Samaria the ends of the earth so this week you get the formal challenge right invite somebody over uh, in the next few weeks and make that specific ask when you're there intimately in that setting because you value them, because you care for them. And the second thing, if we want to produce a shepherd's perspective for the church, value their needs over our own comforts. When you're there and you have an opportunity, value their needs over our own comforts. Maybe you're going, you know what, I don't want to share my home. I don't want to clean my house. I don't want to share my resources with somebody. I don't want to help somebody else in need because, let's be real, that, this is the ch- biggest challenge as American people. The poor among us are rich in the world. They really are. We have so much here in America. We don't want to forgo things. And I want to tell you, that's, this is why I know I married up. I told you about the Christian church in Burlington. As part of their process of getting out of debt, they were, they were grateful to have us serving in their church. And we were grateful to be there. We loved the church family in Burlington. As part of that, when they got out of debt, they paid cash for a $215,000 home, a 3,100-square-foot home to put my family in as a parsonage. It wasn't ours to keep, but it was ours to live in rent-free. We just had to pay utilities. Most of us can afford that kind of deal, right? That was a nice blessing. And my wife is a homemaker. Not many homemakers want to give up 3,100 square feet of three-year-old house. But I married a special lady that is in the ministry because she loves people. And she loves seeing them come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And because she's gifted to work with young people in specific. And we're going to a community full of them. And to see her jump in with the PTO and to, uh, to, to dive in ministering to kids. She's going to be running our, our children's ministry. Uh, you need to know that I feel very blessed that it was Megan herself who started the conversation with me last December when we were on an anniversary trip. She said, I think it might be time, and we should explore um, church planting. That's a pretty good deal. See, we have a lot of comforts that that we have that we don't want to give up. Jesus was willing to give up his comforts look at those first two verses they're really the key verses of this whole text all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him and the pharisees and scribes were complaining this man welcomes sinners and eats with them you see what was happening is up to this point the pharisees number one complaints were the sinners and the tax collectors because they're bent on criticism and so they're always pointing at them and finally jesus is able to get in between them and now, all of a sudden, he shoulders the criticism, doesn't he? He says, I'm, I'm willing to forgo my comfort to show how much I value you. I'm going to receive criticism for hanging out with you. So now their focus is no longer on you. It's on me because I'm with you. Guilty by association, right? There it is. And Jesus, the one who hung on the cross, he's the one who's guilty by this association. woo be like Jesus. It's different, isn't it? It's a perspective change. But Jesus said, look, I'll take criticism. I'm not afraid of criticism. Because I didn't come to worry about who likes me. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
criticize me all day long. And so he tells them this parable. And, and what's he tell them in the parable? Look at verses 5 and 6. He's already gone to look for it. And when he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and comes home. Coming home. In other words, he forwent his comfort to go find that lost person where that lost person was. And when he found him, he didn't pat him on the back and say, all right, go home now. He shouldered the load, didn't he? And isn't that consistent with what he always tells us? Come to me, you who are weak and burdened, and I will give you rest, or you will find rest for yourselves. Take my yoke upon you. It is easy and my burden is light. And you will find rest for yourselves. He wants to yoke himself with us. He doesn't want us to not hit the reins. He's not going to do all the work. He says, take my yoke. And when we think of a yoke, he's going to hit the reins with us. That's the kind of shepherd that we have. One that's going to say, look, I'm not going to ask you to do anything I'm not going to do. I just want you to do it with me. Because he valued the needs of others. And Jesus, that was his model. He always forwent every comfort. Mark chapter 6 is a great text. Here's, here's some fun homework. If you're not reading the Bible anywhere, read Mark chapter 6 this week. Notice this is what happens. The disciples, they go on a missionary journey. God sent, Jesus sends them out. He calls them, uh, appoints them, and sends them out. And uh, they, they come back, and they're excited. In the meantime, John the Baptist loses his head. And so now you can probably imagine they're pretty tense. Okay, by doing this preaching stuff, there's starting to be some persecution on account of it. So things aren't so exciting. And then they come back. They're so excited. They've done so good. And the crowds now are so big that they're hungry and exhausted. And so Jesus says, let's go on a retreat, boys. It's like a boys' camp out, right? Hey, let's get in the boat and go. And so they go across the lake, but things have been going so good that the word spread that all of the people, it says, from many towns, they ran around the lake ahead of them, and they got there, and they're there on the other side of the shore when they show, shore when they show up. And so these boys, they're, they're saying, man, Jesus, we need more of you. And Jesus tells them, I'm sorry, I'm on a staff retreat. That's not what we read in the text. Mark chapter 6, it says he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And they ministered to him. And it says when it was late in the day, the disciples came to him and said the crowds are hungry. Well, I think that was an excuse. We know that they were hungry before they even got in the boat. (laughs) What did they model in practice? They were going to forego their comfort to see somebody else have the opportunity at knowing Jesus. The great shepherd. This is what Jesus modeled. Because he valued the needs of others over his own comfort. And if we want to be more like the shepherd, we need to have a perspective like him. And and we need to be more like the shepherd in helping the lost people find their way home. Jesus did it this way. He shouldered the load. I'm not going to ask anybody to do anything you can't do. I don't think God asks us for anything we don't have. He just asks us for all that we have. So you know your settings and your situations. Who around you can you help shoulder the load? Don't do it all for them. You're going to help them out. Model it like Jesus. Yoke yourselves with them. But we might need to go help shoulder the load. We might need to take some of the criticism and some of the pressure off of the tax collectors and sinners that, that we touch in our life. We might need to appear like the black sheep and shoulder the load for a little bit. We also notice that Jesus went without rest, without food, without shelter. And he did it without complaint because he knew what he came for. And we want to be like Jesus. We like Jesus a lot. And see, Jesus as Savior is a really cool thing in America. Jesus is Lord. This is the tough part. And that's what I'm challenging you to do today, church. When it comes to lost people and evangelism, we don't want to plant churches so that we can just have a bunch of buildings that are tax-free all over this nation. Besides, this nation someday is going to be tax-full. And just so you know, the beautiful thing about planting a church in Kansas is until you're the sole renter or have your own place, you're, the state won't consider you tax-exempt. So I'm even paying taxes right now. Woohoo! And I don't mind. 
Because I know salvation is not going to come through our government. It's going to come through Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Jesus was willing to forgo all those things because he had the emphasis on the proper syllable. He was going to win lost people. Let's look at the third way to produce the shepherd's perspective as we consider what it is to impact the kingdom. And that's we need to rediscover the joy of rescuing lost people. We need to rediscover the joy of rescuing lost people. When I went to Gridley, it was my first ministry, and I, I, I basically I had a heart-to-heart with God. I, I knew that I was going to be going into preaching ministry. Um, that's where some of my gifts were, and they really needed to be polished. I look back at my early sermons, and I know God's got a great place for all those folks in Gridley that heard my early sermons. They were horrible. And God is good that way. But they, they took a chance on a 22-year-old kid to come and preach in Burlington. Well, a year before I got, or Gridley, sorry. A year before I got to Gridley, I'm starting to get old now. It's like children. You don't even know their names anymore. So in Gridley, sorry. I got to Gridley, and a year before I got there, they'd had a church split where all of the young families went to, to go out to a church about 16 miles outside of town. And... Um, and it was, it was me and, and 30 people that I could have called grandma and grandpa. And it was awesome, a great experience. But the elders, they told me, Jeremiah, we, we, hoped you, we hired you in hopes that you'd bring back those young families. And I'm like, they didn't leave because of me. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's have a proper realization. And so it was 18 months into my ministry there in Gridley before we had our first baptism. You're talking about a dry season, right, as a church? And it had been a season before that because they were just really flying by the seat of their pants for that year in, in the interim period. And it was so bad that when we went to fire up the, the heater in the baptistry, we filled the baptistry and it didn't leak. That was a good deal. But then we went to flip the switch on the heater and the motor wasn't, wasn't working. We needed a new heater for our baptistry. And I wish, friends, that I could tell you that the elders were excited about their best purchase of that year a new heater, but we talked way too long about whether or not to even buy a heater until one of the elders said, this is a big enough deal, I'll write the check, I'll buy the heater. What happened, I was in a church who in that season had lost the joy of winning lost people. And that's something that we could never get into that place. We, we need to rediscover the joy of rescuing lost people. And I, I, I wonder if this is part of the problem in North American churches today. I think it's nice when we're only 21 years old, we're not, you know, we haven't rounded the corner of thinking of ourselves and, and doing things like that. And so this ever needs to be in front of us. Why do we exist? We exist because people need to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's our role as the church. We don't save them. We need to get them to the one who saves them. And if we understand our role, we're going to even be better at it. And part of that is when they, get, when they get found, we welcome them into our family and we get excited and jacked up because we realize that the kingdom grew, not because of anything we did, but because someone else believed on what he did. And that's a good day. That is a really good day, and that's exactly what we read in this parable. In verses 6 and 7, coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying to them, rejoice with me. He's not going to party by himself. He's always into big parties. Rejoice with me because I found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who don't need repentance. What a powerful deal. And that's what Jesus modeled all the way through his ministry. We kind of feel a little tension here sometimes. Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to celebrate when someone comes to Jesus. Sometimes we even think, ah, they're just saying it. They're not believing him. We're criticizing people's intent. We feel the tension. The longer that we're in Christ, the more we feel entitled to that goodness. And now here's this new guy that, man, we know their past. We've heard their story. Our story isn't near that good, you know. I mean, Jesus didn't save us near from that much. But that's kind of what Jesus encountered, wasn't it? He ate with the, with the Pharisees. He dined with the Pharisees. He didn't care who you were. He'd get criticized for dining with them too. And remember what he, what he was criticized for with the Pharisee? For letting the prostitute come in and wash his feet. And what's Jesus say to the Pharisee? Look, guy, you didn't even wash my feet when I came in here. And yet with her tears and her hair, she hasn't stopped washing them since she got here. 
he said, I'm going to testify about her <laughs> and what she's done. And then he tells a parable that's very familiar to us, isn't it? There were two debtors that came to uh, the, the loan manager. And one had a big debt and the other had a little debt. And the manager forgave them both. Now, who's going to like the manager more? And the Pharisee says, well, the one with the bigger debt. And Jesus is saying, that's what's going on here, pal. And I think sometimes that's our jealousy if we've been in Christ a long time. Well, we don't have a cool story. Well, that's okay. Both debts were forgiven. And we need to celebrate with every debt that's been forgiven. And that's, that was Jesus' way. Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. He was the teacher in Israel. And he was so nervous about people knowing that he went and hung out with Jesus, he made a midnight appointment. Under the stars they talked, and some of our core doctrine comes from John chapter 3, doesn't it? We can all quote from that chapter. Why? Because Jesus would hang with anybody. If you were to look at a text, here's some more homework for you. In Luke chapter 7, remember Zacchaeus? This tax collector, once again, Jesus was criticized eight chapters prior to where we are right here in Luke 15. For doing the same thing. Because he showed up at a sinner, a tax collector's uh, tree. So that he could get a good view and said, guess what Zacchaeus? I'm hanging with you today. And there was a great victory that day, wasn't there? Because Jesus knew the joy of celebrating wins. We like to win. Sometimes we're like the Jayhawks in football. We have a winless season. Right? I was there in the cold yesterday. Saw some of you guys. Man, what a hard, long season. And you know what I felt like I saw on the field? I, I felt like I saw a team that was so unfamiliar with winning that they didn't even have the heart or the passion to try to win. And might we never get there spiritually? And if we ever get there, might we allow ourselves to go back to the Word and to look at Jesus and say, Man, Jesus shouldered criticism for this because of the win. Sometimes we just need to redefine and, and restate what the wins are and get behind a win so that we can celebrate. The first two verses really are the, the crux of this message. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. That's what was said of Jesus. He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. What's going to be said of you and me? I had great church attendance. He welcomes sinners and tax collectors and eats with them. I hope today as we close that this is a, a day to evaluate ourselves. Has our perspective of late looked more like the Pharisees? I confess it was easier to be there than it was to have a perspective like Jesus's. Where we're bent on criticizing and condemning the church or those in leadership because they're not doing things our way, even when our way's results aren't going as well as we'd like them to go. Perhaps we find ourselves with the perspective of the sheep. Maybe you've been coming here to Crossroads and you're, you know, you're intrigued by the, the reality of the gospel. And how straightforward it is and how weekly we get to celebrate the cross and what Jesus did for us. And if you're here and you've never said, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior and Lord, this is what you need to know today. You have a shepherd in Jesus who left the comforts of heaven to come to earth. We're celebrating that in this season of Christmas because he valued you and he valued me. Because he knew that he could consummate all of the law and the prophets and, and all of the future hopes in his coming on purpose to redeem us. He shouldered our load by taking it to the cross. He did everything that he was portraying already here in Luke chapter 15. And if you need to come to grips with a Savior like that, you got one that you can depend on in Jesus Christ. And we invite you during um, the rest of this message, find the uh, ministers on staff here, uh, anybody, and have this conversation. But for all of us who have come to grips with all that Jesus has forgiven in us, 
Sometimes we need a new perspective in our role as the church. This perspective is imperative in planting new churches. I find it's imperative for all of God's body. And notice, though it can be daunting when we think of winning hundreds and thousands at a time. I want to tell you, that was kind of the hardest thing for me. I I confess to my coach. I've got a coach who planted a church 11 years ago, Greg Garcia, who calls me weekly. And back in the end of July, Greg came to Burlington, and we were at Dairy Queen. It was middle afternoon, though. I didn't get a hamburger. We just had a Coke because he was driving through. And he said, Jeremiah, what's your biggest fear? And I said, man, my biggest fear is getting our first follower. Because there's an old uh, proverb that, um, it's, not, it's not a biblical proverb, it's like a leadership proverb, that he who leads with no followers is only taking a walk. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to be taking a walk. And so, uh, <laughs> so I'm like, man, getting the first one. But sometimes I, I was going and I was looking at you, door, and I'm going, man, how do we win all these people? But I had the appropriate fear. My fear was getting the first one. I felt like if I could get one, we can get two, and then we can get more. Can I tell you how cool God is? My neighbor two doors down, the weekend that we were moving in, we, we met him and we let him know we were here to plant a church. And uh, Ivan and Michelle McGarry uh, lived two doors down. And, and uh, I still had to go back to Burlington and work one more week in the office. And um, I was supposed to work through Thursday, but I had cleaned my office out on Tuesday, and the parsonage was already cleared with nothing in it. I was sleeping on a sleeping bag on the floor. My family was already in Eudora. And so Tuesday morning, we had a staff meeting, and um, an elder came in and said, Holcomb, your office is cleaned. Your (laughs) vehicle's loaded. You've got nothing else to do here. Eudora needs you. Go to Eudora. And so I remember I got in my house, and I sat down on my couch, and I'm like, oh, cool. Now I've got a new job, and where do I begin? And Megan and I were in a conversation, and within 15 minutes, the doorbell rings. And Michelle is a para at, a, at the high school in DeSoto, using her um, Spanish background uh, as an English as second language para. And obviously, paras are off in the summertime. And she just got news that morning that her grandfather had passed away or grandmother, in Mexico, old Mexico, and she wasn't going to be able to get back for the funeral, and she just wanted somebody to pray with her. Later, she went on to, to confess, saying, when you guys told us that you were planting a church, I wondered if you were here for, for me. I didn't know Michelle by name, you know, before that. Ivan's going to be running our audio-video uh, team, our AV team, and Michelle, when we open an outreach team, she's gonna be, she can throw a party. And so we're excited to have Ivan and Michelle on our team. They haven't been worshiping anywhere in a long time, but they're excited about this place. And they showed up at that, and they came to our ice cream party, and they've been with us all the way. Our first followers within 15 minutes, not because I did anything, but because God said, Holcomb, I'm gonna show you. Just focus on one. The fears, they can go away. We serve a big God. We're excited to be in this process. We thank you for having us be here today. If we want to win many people, though, let it begin with one. And as we close our services, our ushers get ready for our time of communion today. Um, Think of that person. Invite them over for dinner. Maybe it's a family. You get your family together with theirs. It could be your your kid's friend. In their situation, they, they need some hope this holiday. And it's something that you can do. It's tangible. It's real. And uh, the bottom line today is simply this. We need to produce the shepherd's perspective, and when we do, we'll rescue more lost people. It just starts with one. But we've got to value them. We've got to go to them, even forgoing some of our comforts, ready to celebrate a big win. Let's pray together. Almighty God in heaven, we're humbled by you and all that you've done for us. We're thankful for Jesus and the cross and ultimately for our salvation that's been paid for. And God, I pray that you would stir within us a great desire to communicate the simplicity of the gospel message, the good news of what you've already conquered because you did leave the comforts of heaven to come be with us, not just to hang out with us, but to redeem us. And I pray, God, you would teach us to value other people 
even those who are lost, even those who are unchurched, especially those, God. Allow us to lay down some of our comforts. Maybe we're willing to get up earlier or to, to surrender an evening out of the week to host a study out of our home or to do something intentional because we care about them like you modeled. And God, might it be said of us that we were able to welcome and eat with sinners and tax collectors. And might they not stay in their sin, but might they be one to you. And when they're found, might we rejoice with the heavens and knowing that you will get the glory because of Jesus as we pray in his name.